I'm delighted to be able once again to join a, a CP event to discuss these important and fascinating counterterrorism issues and to take the opportunity also to, to introduce uh, everyone to the monitoring team's 27th uh, report uh, on the status of the threat from ISIL and Al Qaeda, which was published online just over a month ago. I'll offer a few highlights, but we'll then be happy to answer questions on any aspect of the report or of the monitoring team's mandate more widely. First of all, let me say COVID-19 um, remained a major influence on terrorism and counterterrorism in late 2020. Uh, ISIL continued to call for attacks on its enemies while they were distracted and their CT defences presumably impaired. Uh, but the idea of weaponizing the virus was never developed into a practical plan. Generally, member states assess that ISIL has been unable to flesh out a strategy for the pandemic and its messaging remains aspirational and lacking practical focus. In non-conflict zones, movement and meeting restrictions to inhibit the spread of the pandemic have impacted terrorists. ISIL personnel find it difficult to travel, gather or raise revenue. Public targets are largely unavailable where a full lockdown is in force and varied levels of restriction translate into uh, different levels of uh, reduction of accessibility of targets. Currently lacking an external operations capability, ISIL was already struggling to mount high impact attacks and the pandemic has compounded this. Although frequent low casualty attacks can have a high cumulative psychological impact in non-conflict zones, as for example, described just now by Hans uh, in, uh, in Europe. Member states are concerned lest ISIL increase efforts to raise its media profile. With susceptible people having been trapped at home and online, such efforts may cause a bottle up and release effect. Threat intent may manifest in a rash of attacks when restrictions ease in various locations at different times. Or indeed, you could see attacks immediately before the reimposition of restrictions, where there's one of those uh, uh, one of those um, uh, convulsions of uh, public policy that we've seen so much of during the pandemic. In conflict zones, threat levels have already increased and are expected to rise further. Of course, in conflict zones, public health measures can't be enforced, and terrorists continue to travel freely. Over time, then. The pandemic also will hurt economies, divert government resources, weaken international cooperation and assistance. And this particular global economic and political toll of the pandemic will ultimately increase the longer term threat in both conflict zones and non-conflict zones. In some African arenas affected by conflict, ISIL had notable successes last year. Despite setbacks in Afghanistan, ISIL Khorasan remains ambitious to exploit difficulties in the, in the Afghan peace process. And then meanwhile, ISIL continues to pin its main hopes for resurgence on chronic insecurity in its Iraqi Syrian core area. Looking at ISIL's leadership, Amr Mohammed Saeed Abdurrahman al Mawla is not seen as having changed the strategic direction of ISIL much since he became the leader in late 2019. Of course, counter-terrorist operations have inhibited his command and control, and this has accelerated the existing tendency to delegate authority from ISIL core to the provinces and increased the role of the general directorate of provinces. This could prove key to reviving the ISIL external operations capability, which member states expect may occur during 2021 and will depend partly upon the efficiency and interoperability of the provinces. As ISIL gets better established in various conflict zones and destabilizes them further, it will have more time and space to project an external threat via the global network. Thus, if member states neglect conflict zones, that will increase long-term insecurity in non-conflict zones as the directed and enabled threat from ISIL rises. Forward defense remains essential in CT. Al Mola has maintained his early policy of avoiding direct communication. And this preserves his personal safety, but some member states assess that he runs the risk of allowing global supporters to lose interest. His spokesman, Abu Hamza al Qureshi, has released four audio broadcasts in the, in the past year or so, but he is a poor substitute for the leader. On the 18th of October, Abu Hamza betrayed frustration in his injunction for supporters to spend less time online and more mounting attacks, jailbreaks and other operations. <laughs> 
Besides member states, he specified Al-Qaeda and the Taliban as targets for high impact attacks. Now, I do want to touch on Al-Qaeda, although it's not within the, strictly within the terms of this talk, but it's very difficult to speak about uh, these um, Salafi jihadi extremist groups without uh, factoring in uh, Al-Qaeda as part of it. And I'll, I'll come to a number of reasons why that's the case as, as, as we continue. Um, very important to note that Al-Qaeda has suffered multiple leadership losses in Afghanistan, Mali, Somalia, Yemen, and in the Syrian governorate of Idlib. Uh, the Al-Qaeda number two, Abu Muhammad al-Masri, is reported to have been killed in August. There were rumors of the death of Ayman al-Zawahiri, but those are unconfirmed. And on balance, I think we believe that he's probably still alive, but in fragile health. Saif al-Adl, formerly the Al-Qaeda number three, is probably becoming more important. And when Al-Qaeda does require a new leader, it will be difficult for that person to move to Afghanistan. The Taliban, of course, are under pressure to fulfill their peace process obligations and to suppress the international threat from both ISIL and Al-Qaeda. So the long-term status of Al-Qaeda, its strength, strategy, leadership location, does require monitoring. I'll move to some localized developments around the world. Um, I won't be able to go into this in huge depth, but of course we can come back to any of these areas in questions. Iraq and Syria, of course, remain the main focus of ISIL ambition. The group's presence is mainly in the form of clandestine cells seeking to pursue a protracted insurgency. These cells are not micromanaged by the central leadership, but given a significant degree of tactical autonomy. ISIL has sustained attacks in rural and desert areas with a lower rate in urban areas. And it's been particularly active in the Syrian Iraqi border region and in the governorates of Diyala, Kirkuk and Salah Adin along the Hamreen mountain range. Likewise, ISIL fighters operate freely on the Syrian side of the border around Deir Azur. Border crossing remains too easy for them. The estimate of active ISIL militants in Iraq and in Syria is roughly 10,000. Uh, the majority of whom are based in Iraq. But the, the growing capability of the Iraqi security forces in comparison with CT operations on the other side of the border means that ISIL operations are on an increasing trajectory in Syria and decreasing in Iraq currently. Foreign terrorist fighters numbering in the low thousands remain active within this ISIL core conflict zone. Member states assess that these elements have been assimilated by family and other ties within their new habitat. And it seems that very few are now choosing to leave the region. Meanwhile, with regard to fighters in detention, there are enduring concerns about the possibility of their being released from holding facilities and rejoining ISIL or escaping from the region, presumably via Turkey. Some ISIL leaders and their families and ISIL facilities, facilitators continue to reside uh, in, in the Idlib area of northwestern Syria. Speaking though of northwestern Syria, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, uh, the former al-Nusra Front or HTS, uh, is still the strongest terrorist group around Idlib with about 10,000 mostly Syrian fighters. HTS dominates the so-called Salvation Government through its extensive access to resources. It forces local leaders to accept its authority. The other major Al-Qaeda affiliate in the Idlib area is Huras Adin or HAD with between two and two and a half thousand fighters. It's been weakened by leadership losses in 2020, and it's overshadowed by HTS, but it has significant numbers of foreign terrorist fighters and it poses an external threat. The Idlib area continues to harbor other terrorist groups composed mainly of contingents of foreign terrorist fighters who remain subject to the authority of HTS. These groups include Chechens, Central Asians, and Uyghurs. HTS offers training camps and logistical support to like-minded groups. Turning to the Arabian Peninsula, Khaled Batarfi, the relatively new leader of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, or AQAP, since the killing of Qasem al-Rimi in early 2020, was reportedly arrested in October and his deputy killed. The monitoring team report on Batarfi's arrest was disputed by AQAP, and they were able to surface current early 2021 communications by Batarfi. Now we are studying what happened, but we do believe that Batarfi was in detention in late, uh, late 2020. However, it is that he now comes to be in a position to appear and to deny it. AQAP's leader in Abyan was killed in November amid further military setbacks. 
AQAP also suffered disputes and desertions, but remained operationally active inside Yemen against, uh, against uh, its international um, enemies and uh, government of Yemen uh, opponents and also infrastructure targets. Following the recent normalization of relations between Israel and some Arab countries, Al-Qaeda's Al-Sahab media and uh, AQAP's Malahan media condemned the UAE and Bahraini leaderships and issued threats. ISIL spokesperson Abu Hamza also called on the 18th of October for attacks on Western nationals in Gulf states. Thus far, the only uh, such attacks to take place were against French interests in Saudi Arabia following the start of the trial related to the 2015 Charlie Hebdo attacks in Paris. ISIL Yemen sustained further blows in July and August 2020 as counterterrorism operations caused the death of some of their leaders, including their Commander General Abu al-Walid al-Adni and explosives expert Abu Suleiman al-Adni. Following these losses, ISIL Yemen is now assessed to be in a period of tactical recovery. It remains in conflict with AQAP, a dynamic between AQ and ISIL affiliates that is repeated around the world and which does, when it escalates to active fighting, seem to weaken both parties and undermine their ability to threaten member states. Moving to North and West Africa, ISIL Libya is currently in decline, especially with confirmation by member states of the death on the September of September the 15th in Sapa of the group's leader, Abu Abdullah al Libi. But a significant contingent of ISIL fighters remains in the South and there are also sleeper cells in the North in the coastal towns. Al Qaeda remains present in Southwestern Libya although one of its cells was disrupted in Ubari on the 28th of November with seven arrests, including a fighter who had recently returned from Mali. After the death of Drukdel, Abu Ubaidah Yusuf al-Anabi took over the leadership of Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb or AQIM. As an, Algeria, as an Algerian, al-Anabi reflects continuity in the leadership from Drukdel, despite the AQIM shift towards the Sahel region under Algerian military pressure. Iyad Aghali remains the key Al-Qaeda figure in the Sahel, assisted by Amadou Kufa in the Masina, Sidan Aghita in Kidal, and Talha al-Libi in Tumbuk Tumbuktu. After the 18th of August coup, Malian troops continue to cooperate with international partners on counterterrorism. The new government's open dialogue with the JNIM, or Jamaat Nusrat al-Islam, while Muslimin leadership also shows continuity. On the 8th of October, 200 Jainim fighters were released in exchange for a leading Malian political figure and three Western hostages. A few weeks earlier, Jainim had murdered a Swiss hostage who they'd held since 2016. Jainim certainly seeks to exploit any signs of political weakness that it perceives. It continues to destabilize Burkina Faso and seeks to expand such activity to Senegal and Côte d'Ivoire and other neighboring countries but it is losing men in such in, in, in counter-terrorism operations. More than 100 operatives from Katiba Masina and Katiba Gurma uh, were killed in early November, when it also lost its third chief of operations in 21 months, Bah Ag Musa. Even so, Jainim remains operationally effective, able to carry out simultaneous attacks on the 30th of November with indirect fire against international military targets in Gao, Kidal and Menaka. Other key terrorist groups in West Africa include Islamic State Greater Sahara, Islamic State West Africa province, and Boko Haram. ISGS suffered losses in counterterrorism operations and in fighting with Jainim, but ISGS command and control is believed to remain intact. In the Lake Chad Basin area, both ISWAP and Boko Haram have maintained their level of operations. ISWAP benefits from strong ties to ISIL core leadership. This is seen in its extensive coverage in ISIL media and propaganda. Turning to East and Central Africa, the main story in East Africa, of course, is the impact of instability in Somalia and the activities of Somali extremist networks uh, associated with Al-Qaeda and ISIL. Al-Shabaab remains the single most resilient and threatening Al-Qaeda affiliate in the world. Whilst ISIL Somalia, although much smaller and weaker, has taken on a role as the hub for IS Central Africa province in Mozambique and the DRC. There's evidence of coordination, finance and skills transfer between the Somali, DRC and Mozambique arenas. ISIL Corps possibly directs some attacks via Somalia, as well as remitting funds. In Mozambique, 
ISCAP activity is focused on the Cabo Delgado area where the group has ex expanded its, its presence and activity. It seized and held the port of Mosimboa de Praia in the face of sustained military assault from the government forces. On the 14th of October 2020, the group conducted its first cross-border incursion into Tanzania, concurrently with two other attacks that it mounted in Cabo Delgado. ISCAP in the DRC continued to mount attacks in Beni and other locations in North Kivu and Ituri provinces, including attacks on military targets that netted Congolese military hardware for the group. ISCAP was observed to use both conventional weaponry and IEDs. In October 2020, ISCAP attacked Kangbai Central Prison in Beni, securing the release of over a thousand prisoners, including about 200 ISCAP operatives and enablers. And I'm sure you'll be familiar with the recent, more recent story uh, early this year of uh, a successful jailbreak uh, by Al-Shabaab in Somalia. So I think we need to look at jailbreaks as a, uh, as a serious uh, emerging trend, uh, encouraged, of course, by uh, by the ISIL spokesperson's uh, speech uh, in October. Turning to Europe, uh, I won't go on at length about this. I'm sure, I'm sure we'll come to this in greater detail later, but of course we had a lot of violence uh, in, uh, West, in a number of Western European countries in the autumn of 2020. And, and I think the key thing I want to say about this is that it seems to, in many cases, to have been inspired either by, by both ISIL and Al-Qaeda, or you know, just by a generalized, uh, generalized radicalization. And this I think is one reason why it's important not to uh, obsess over nomenclature. I think especially in non-conflict zones, uh, we see, a lot, of, uh, we see a, lot, a lot of radicalization online and it's not really safe to talk uh, exclusively in terms of this being ISIL activity or Al-Qaeda activity. I think we must be alert to the fact that this is emerging as a uh, as a trend that is a rather amorphous, b quite difficult to follow as a result, and c of course may well see the emergence of new brands uh, that want to uh, strike out uh, with some kind of distinctive identity of their own. Uh, interestingly, the Vienna shooter uh, had been enrolled in a de-radicalization program, and that underlines existing concerns in Europe about the effectiveness of such programs and associated issues like for example, prison radicalization and the, uh, and the uh, release of, uh, of extremist prisoners uh, from, from after the, end, at the end of their jail sentences. On Central and South Asia, um, I think the big story here is the uh, peace process. Uh, and despite the optimism that some people feel about that uh, peace process, um, the situation uh, in Afghanistan, of course, remains very challenging. Uh, ISIL-K has proved to be stubbornly resilient despite its degraded military capabilities. And although the group faces challenges in its ability to seize and hold significant territory, it has claimed responsibility for a number of recent high profile attacks uh, in Afghanistan, uh, including the devastating May 2020 attack on a maternity hospital in Kabul, and the assault on the Jal Jalalabad city prison on the 2nd of August, another uh, really uh, striking uh, and, uh, and, and uh, high impact jailbreak. In June 2020, a new leader of ISIL Khorasan was announced, Shahab al muhajir al muhajir is reportedly the chief of the so-called Khorasan region, uh, which would include uh, Afghanistan and a range of other uh, neighboring countries uh, as part of the, uh, of the ISIL sort of hub and spoke approach. Um, he also reportedly had earlier affiliations to the Haqqani network and maintains familial ties to the group. So there's an interesting question there about what is the nature of the link between the Haqqani network and ISIL-K. Um, ISIL-K is currently assessed to have significantly fewer fighters than we used to assess. Um, these days we say probably between one and 2,000, whereas we used to say uh, you know, between three and 4,000. Um, so it has suffered a lot of attrition uh, but it still has a presence in a number of Afghan provinces and is expected to continue to target, uh, particularly the cities. That seems to be the trend, uh, its current, uh, current tactics. Uh, Kabul and provincial capitals uh, are the significant cities. Member states report little evidence of significant changes in relations between Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Al-Qaeda assesses its future in Afghanistan depends upon its close ties to the Taliban, as well as the success of Taliban, uh, the Taliban in the country. And it is going to seek not to embarrass the Taliban, of course. Taliban is interestingly starting to register and restrict foreign extremists, and that could bode well 
for the peace process. Even so, the overall number of Al-Qaeda and its affiliates in Afghanistan is significant. It's estimated in the hundreds, spread across maybe 11 Afghan provinces. Uh, and the killing of several Al-Qaeda commanders in Taliban-controlled territory underlines how close the two groups still are. The Taliban is not believed to have taken any steps against Al-Qaeda that it could not easily and quickly reverse. Tehrik at Taliban Pakistan, TTP, was reported to have overseen a reunification of splinter groups that took place in Afghanistan and was moderated by Al-Qaeda. This was expected to increase the threat to Afghanistan, Pakistan and the region. Five entities pledged allegiance to TTP in July and August, including Shahriya Massoud Group, Jamaat al Ahrar, Hezbollah Ahrar, Amjad Faruqi Group, and the Usman Saifullah Group, um, formerly known as Lashkar e Jangvi. Now, this will have increased the TTP's strength and its prestige, and is already assessed as having increased, in, increased attacks in the region. Member states believe that TTP fighting strength. Uh, could be anything up to 6,000. It's a significant group. Um, one member state reported that it was responsible for more than 100 cross-border attacks between July and October of 2020. Touching briefly on Southeast Asia uh, before, I, before I wrap up, um, Southeast Asia remains home to a number of Al-Qaeda and ISIL-related factions, in particular in the southern Philippines. Uh, although counterterrorism forces reported successes in disrupting some cells and averting some imminent attacks, the region continues to experience violence initiated or inspired by ISIL. One continuing trend in the region concerns the prominence of women in the group, including in actually carrying out suicide bombings. Two such attacks occurred in the Philippines on the 24th of August 2020, both involving women believed to be widows of Abu Sayyaf group fighters. In October 2020, officials in the Philippines arrested a woman preparing an attack. So it would be a mistake to take our eyes, I think, away from Southeast Asia. Uh, again, I think there are some interesting developments there, um, some methodologies, uh, also a lot of sort of clearly sort of clash of civilizations type attacks, attacks that are deliberately targeted against religious, uh, religious sites or communities. Uh, and you can see the, the intent there to sort of stir up hatred, uh, possibly to provoke uh, revenge attacks and polarize people. And I think that's another key trend that we need to look for. Uh, again, thinking back to 2019, the Christchurch attacks, followed by the Sri Lanka Easter Sunday attacks. Uh, there's obviously a dangerous path there if um, different stamps of extremists uh, can inspire and uh, help each other rally uh, more like-minded extremists. Um, I don't want to go on beyond then. I think I've talked probably long enough. I, I didn't get into terror finance. We can come back to it if people would like to. Uh, there haven't been major changes uh, in that sphere uh, in the last six months particularly, um, but, uh, but it is interesting that we're starting to see slightly more in the way of, um, of cryptocurrency uh, being uh, used by terrorist groups. Um, and uh, I also uh, recognize that I really only very briefly touched on the uh, FTF issue and uh, the camps in northeastern Syria. Uh, perhaps I should just finish by emphasizing that although Again, we haven't seen major developments in that area over the past, uh, you know, what I would consider the, our recent reporting period. Um, we do see these as the big long-term strategic issues. Uh, clearly, if we mismanage the FTF issue, uh, we are looking at problems that will be being felt 20 years from now. Uh, there's a need for people who are practitioners of counterterrorism, uh, and that includes politicians and it includes officials. Uh, to look beyond their period of office and to think about uh, what policy is necessary to mitigate threats that otherwise will be uh, will be a problem uh, a generation from now. This is really important. And of course, equally true of the issue of the camps in northeastern Syria. Um, you know, uh, these are complicated. There are legal rights, uh, human rights, uh, humanitarian issues tied up with this. Uh, there are some significant def definitional challenges. Um, the fact of the matter is that uh, if you have young, vulnerable people kept in unsuitable conditions uh, month after month, possibly year after year, um, you are, instead of having uh, a uh, problem of, uh, of uh, traumatized minors, um, you're going to end up with a problem of hardened terrorists. And so uh, the UN strongly supports the uh, initiative of a number of member states 
uh, to push for a much more proactive approach to dealing with the camps and to repatriation. And I'll stop there. Thanks.